Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spock coming at you with the weekly comic book roundup. We've covered our Avenger, this week's Avengers books and X Men books, as well as a few DC books. Now it's time to move on to well, three Star Wars books and a few uh, and some other Marvel books. Kicking things off, we've got Star Wars number twenty-five. So um, this issue is not continuing the does not continue the current story. It is just kind of a, you know, telling some some small store some small stories from various points in the Star Wars universe. Um, that just kind of is, you know an anniversary issue kind of thing. So we've got we have uh, three story or four stories: Obi Wan and Anakin, the lesson; Darth Vader, the lesson; Kylo Ren, see you around, kid; and Poe Dameron. The eulogy for Snap. So, um, the, le the Obi Wan and Anakin story, the lesson, takes place in the Jedi Temple. Um, and Anakin asks Obi Wan, why lightsabers? Um, with Anakin pointing out that lightsabers are powered by kyber crystals and the energy inside them, but energy couldn't power anything. Why not kyber spears, or kyber blasters even? And, uh, apparently Anakin had been th thinking about it. He could, and he could, he best he could build something, however, Anakin, or Obi-Wan cuts him off, saying, you know, let me guess, a weapon no one's ever, ever seen. Something that would really set you apart from the other Padawans. And Anakin says it w wouldn't be for him, it would be for the Order. Make them more powerful. And so, Obi-Wan explains, when he was a Padawan, he came up with the idea of two short-bladed sabers, each attached to a thin chain. Obi-Wan, or Anakin, states that, you know, that sounds amazing, and, uh, Obi-Wan says he, he would have looked very impressive, assuming he didn't chop his foot off trying to use it. It was suggested to, to Qui-Gon, and Qui- and basically Qui-Gon told Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan's about to tell Anakin, about how we wish to be is about how he wished to be seen, and how that ties into the central mission of the Jedi Order. They did not want to be powerful, they wished to stand tall against the dark. Their tools reflect that goal, especially the lightsaber. They all wield the same one with, with minor variations. They could make kyber bombs or blasters, indeed, it's been tried. There are, there are a few weapons like that in the archives. But anyone can fire a blaster. Very few can safely and skillfully wield a lightsaber. Everyone in the galaxy knows this to be true. They, the Jedi want their opponents to know that they use a weapon that requires intention, training, precision, and choice. The lightsaber symbolizes the care with which they approach their gifts through the Force, and the care with which they wield them. It reminds others that while they could do more, they very, pur very purposely do not. He adds that they achieve a weapon with limitations, with difficulties. You cannot use a lightsaber to destroy a city or a planet. Every death or injury it inflicts must be precisely chosen. Lightsaber tells the galaxy that the Jedi are not destroyers, they are protectors. And Anakin points out the Sith use them as well. And Obi-Wan says, says, yes, this is true, and the Sith would give would give you their reasons. Ultimately, Obi-Wan believes like, that the Sith use lightsabers because they like to think that anything the Jedi can do, they can do better. And then and with that, Obi-Wan and Anakin return to uh, their spark. Next we have the Darth Vader story, The Lesson, taking place uh, in the works district of uh, Coruscant. The Emperor instructs Vader to fight him. During the early in the fight, uh, the Emperor uh, 
bests Vader and says and tells Vader that he fights the Jedi. As if the lightsaber was, was his only weapon. It is not. Adding the Sith's weapon is is the dark side of the force. And the dark side touches everything. It's and ba basically he does to uh, the Emperor does to Vader. Pretty much what Vader did to Luke on Cloud City, using their surroundings as basically throwing throwing items from their surroundings at, at him. All, but the, but for different reasoning. This is mainly just to teach Vader a lesson. Next we have our Kylo Ren story. See you around, kid. Um, aboard the Steadfast. Uh, before between the events of episodes. Uh, Eight and nine. Uh, Kylo Ren has arrived at, at has returned to Crate. Nice his lightsaber, swings around a few times. Then Ofrona, the former outpost of the Jedi Order. The knights, one of the, the knights of Ren, ask him what it is he's looking for, and Kylo and Ren explains. Kylo Ren explains he's looking for a ghost. <laughs> Apparently, Ofrona is where uh, knights of Ren first met uh, ben, Kylo and Luke. And then they go to the planet where the Jedi Temple was, a, where Luke made his Jedi Academy. Where he uh, insists that uh, the ghost he's looking for show, him, show himself. The ghost being Luke. No more tricks, just the reckoning that uh, Kylo deserves. He doesn't say that he's a fool. And, he, and as he as he boards the shuttle, he instructs General Hux to bombard, to bombard the location from orbit with all batteries. Which brings us to our final story: a eulogy for Snap. We start off with the death of Snap Wexley during the Battle of Exegol in uh, uh, Return and Rise of Skywalker. Afterwards, um, the remaining members of Black Squadron have a, have a little, you know, remembrance ceremony for him. Including his, including his wife. Um, they drink a toast to him. And they share stories about him. <clears throat> and the final toast is to Black Squad, to Snap, to Black Squadron. All the stories they told, and all the stories yet to come. And that is where the issue ends. All we get, all we get, looks like is a, is a shot of the cover for the next issue. So. But uh, very nice. Uh, I spent, I really liked the uh, the sequel trilogy stories. I feel like the see you around the the Kylo Ren story really did kind of add a bit to uh, to Kylo Ren's character. Um, Feeling like he was he deserved to be punished for what he had done. And uh, the eulogy for Snap was very, was very nice, very touching. Um, but anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got Darth Vader number twenty-five. Now, a quick disclaimer: I've apparently missed the last few issues of Darth Vader. 
Uh, I intend to remedy that, and I will likely do a video covering those those missing three issues uh, as soon as I can get up, get my hands on them. Um, however, a brief overview of what's happened is that. Uh, Does it list the name of planet? On the planet Gabrador 3, um, Kitzer, or Kister, um, well, Kister, Kister and Wald. Kister, I know for a fact, was an old friend of, of Anakin's from uh, Tatooine. Um, but Kister and Wald have told Vader the plight of their community, and so. Vader and Sabe launched an, have launched an attack against the corrupt governor working with Crimson Dawn. During the battle, Ochi and Bastoon raced to join the fight and, and allowed the governor, but in everything that was going on, allowed the governor to escape. And so, Vader is taking Ochi's spear and is pursuing the governor on his own. So, that's where we start off is with the governor trying to escape with uh, Crimson Dawn while Vader pursues. <clears throat> Governor gets to, the sh to her ship, but uh, Vader tries to pull it down as it, la as it launches. Um, barely gets away. Vader tries to follow. Um, Ochi and Sabe are, have, are trying to figure out what it was that uh, was going on on the planet. Uh, with now Sabe's droid said, explaining to Sabe that uh, the planetary governor was was using a, a facility the facility that her and Ochi are at at to process the energy harnessed from the planet. But uh, Doctor Aira explains that the question is what she's using to harvest the energy. That part of the plan was never revealed. Oshi tries to leave, but uh, Sabe explains that uh, he will stay right there and follow orders. Um, the stormtroopers there turn their, turn their blasters on Ochi. Ochi reminds him that uh, Sabe is a rebel sympathizer. Though Zed points out that Sabe has been given the title of Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander, and therefore outranks him in one of the room, by order of Lord Vader himself. Vader arrives, Vader chase, tracks the shuttle to uh, a Star Destroyer, boards it, and uh, when uh, the Imperial forces aboard try to stop him, well, yeah, try is, the, is definitely the operative word. And so Vader contacts the uh, the executor explaining to lock it, lock on to the source of, of his transmission, as it is uh, the governor's flagship. If if Vader does not countermand his or the following order within two hours, it is to be destroyed. And he asks where the governor is. Meanwhile, um, Kidster, Wald, Ochi, and Sabe. Managed to discover that something is uh, happening with the energy, with the energy being harvested from the planet, that's causing a storm that's powerful to move against wind currents. They find the facility that it's at, and uh, both Kidster and Sabi are seemingly sucked into the storm when uh, Vader arrives on the planet. And uh, apparently, there are, all the speeders are, are damaged beyond use. The only, all that's left is Kister's old racer. The wall explains that no one could ever, ever drive it but him. And Vader eyes the uh, the old pod racer and he says, "We shall see." <laughs> Guess we're getting some pod racing next issue.
it, it, it's hard to really give an opinion on the on, overall because that I haven't read the, la the last three issues, but it seems interesting. I, the Sabe story was definitely uh, the Sabe story that was definitely starting to get interesting uh, at the end of issue twenty one. So anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got New Fantastic Four number two, where we left off in the. Uh, the new FF had reassembled in Vegas, um, where a demon was uh, manipulating the unhoused, popula the unhoused popula population, uh, basically to cause, you know, to cause trouble on, on the surface of, on the surface in Vegas. Um, so Joe fixed it, gathered together the uh, the other three members of the new FF. And around the same time, a local priest had also wished that the new FF, uh, the FF, could maybe really show up and do something about said demon. Um, and when they confronted the demon in, in, under, in the tunnels underneath the city, the priest wished that they that they were gone, or they, they, they were they, they weren't there. And suddenly, the priest was uh, was elsewhere, and Hulk, Spider-Man, and Wolverine were back and at Four Freedoms Plaza, while Ghost Rider was still there to deal with the demon. So, they, the issue begins, apparently, John even briefed on what's going on. Um, they, had, <clears throat> they asked to borrow the Fantastic Car, but Johnny says, Johnny says no, but he'll give him a ride back out there. And he'll even lend a hand. Ghost is having a hell of a time dealing with the demons and his, and his hench demons. Um, the priest is on a bus back to uh, to Vegas. I'm trying to figure out how he ended up in Reno. Or wishing that he wasn't that he was that he wasn't there, and then he said he. And he figures, well, maybe that'll work, do the trick. So he wishes he was with Fantastic Four, and suddenly he's gone. And hanging off the front, the front end of the Fantastic Car for a moment, but uh, he, before he falls, before he fall, hits the ground, the Human Torch catches him. Um, Wolverine at Asks what the priest's deal is, and uh, the priest simply tells him that he wishes things and they come true. And Wolverine says, "Okay." With the father saying, "You just accept that?" And Logan says that you know, when you've seen the stuff that he's seen, nothing phases you. But uh, in the tunnel beneath, beneath Vegas, uh, Ghost Rider is still dealing with the uh, demon and uh, turns his uh, chain into a spear, which he then uses to. She then throws through the demon's chest. But, uh, well, to, to slow the demon down, he bushes the, the, one of the ends through Ghost Rider as well. When he orders his minion, when he orders his minions to take Ghost Rider, he turns his, the chain, links of his chain into shurikens. And, uh, the demon further exerts control over over the uh, non-demonic hordes in in the tunnels and above ground, leading to more chaos on the in the city. When the FF, when our when the rest of the new FF and Human Torch all show up, however. The demon that possesses uh, Human Torch, and that is where the issue ends. I am definitely enjoying this book. Um, kind, of, kind of a shame it's only a miniseries. I, I, I looked, but uh, fun stuff so far. Definitely dig it. 
Moving on to our next book, we've got Moon Knight, Black, White, and Blood, number three. As per usual, we got we have three stories. We've got Wrong Turn by Erica Schultz and Dave Lopez, No Empty Sky by Jim Zub and uh, Jibril Morissette Fan, and Astronaut by Anna Senti, Stefano Raphael, and Chris Sotomayor. So, wrong turn. Um, a bank robbery is in progress, and uh, as they leave, they get into a cab. A cab being driven by none other than Jake Lockley. Jake is seeing and hearing Moon Knight as well, and uh, he's trying to get them to where they. He uh, happily tries to get them where they need to go. Coney Island. And uh, he uh, also manages to subdue the, the, uh, his passengers. Knocking them out before the, uh, the cab hits the water. And so the story ends with uh, Jake talking to a one of the cops about what's happened. Detective, Detective Flint, so he's fine. Nothing to worry about. But uh, well, the three bank robbers got all beat up from the impact. But hope and hopeful. David Flint says that hopefully the uh, insurance will cover the the crash. The Moon Knight says that he's sure Stephen Grant, Stephen Grant can just cut a check. Bring us to our next story: No Empty Sky. Moon Knight crashes in on a group of, on a group of cultists, kind of beats his way through them, being encouraged by throughout by Kanshu. They're about to sacrifice a young girl who conscious states is a focal point for destiny. And uh, he prevents the sacrifice, awakens the uh, young girl, and uh, apparently when Moon Knight asks if there's any particular reason uh, it's for, for him to put it, the mark of Kanshi on the young girl's forehead. Um, this girl, named Mirwit, has the potential to take Mark's place when the time comes. The cult says it as well, which is why they sought to harm her, harm Kanshi through her. And Moon Knight says that maybe she deserves to live life on her own terms instead of being marked and manipulated by the gods. Though Conchie does point out if saving Mark's life was one of his was one of those manipulations. That he has that he had no, but he had a choice. You know, why why doesn't she get one? But uh Moon Knight saves her. And they leave. Here's to our final story, Astronauts. Moon Knight's on a, uh, a moon trip. Corporate moon trip. Apparently, the man in charge wanted to uh, basically strip mine the moon. But uh, his assistant convinced Moon Knight to come along. Be good for PR, for Convince the guy to bring Moon Knight along with his affinity for the moon. Thought it'd be, it might be good for PR. But it, the whole the real reason was to stop the uh, the, strip, the pension of the of the moon. Um, fun fight scene in Zero G with, lots of, with literally spaghetti sauce floating about. Um, and flashes to all of uh, Moon Knight's various personalities. But uh, turns out 
the uh, woman who uh, convinced him, well, Moon Knight figured out the t her tell for lying. Apparently, she blushes, blushes when she lies. Apparently, Moon Knight finds it quite fetching. And that is where the story and the issue ends. I, I, I'm, I'm loving these black, these black, white, and blood minis. With, uh, I, I enjoy. I guess I, I enjoyed the Carnage one, but not as much as I've enjoyed Wolverine, Deadpool, and Electro. Wolverine, Deadpool, Electro, Moon Knight ones. But uh, anyway, moving on to our last book for the moment, we've got Maestro number five. Where we left off after uh, Abomination, or after Namor attacked Dystopia with with uh, Giganto, um, Maestro and Abomination so managed to stop uh, Giganto and uh, Namor was teleported back to uh, Latveria. Um, Maestro and Hulk pulled themselves out of the ocean with Ma or Maestro and Abomination pulled themselves out of the ocean with Abomination when he has a trigger for the transmit device and he activates it. The plan being to go back to uh, for the two of them to go back to Latveria. Apparently he's trying. He's been pushing the button for a while and nothing happens because it still has to be activated by Winston, who was incinerated by Doom. So now they have to plan. They can banner an abomination. Oh, my strong abomination continue talking. Um, but the abomination kind of say, you know, he doesn't feel like he has anything really to live for anymore. You know. And asks what keeps what keeps Banner going, what keeps Maestro going. And he's and uh, he's, Man, Maestro explains that uh, you know, yeah. So do you have any idea how many people have wanted to be dead over the years? So if he dies, if I die, then they win. And much more of those bastards win. And Abomination points out, even though they're long dead, and I'm like, yeah. Abomination feels that's messed up. And then the tra the transmit uh, starts working, and so Maestro grabs on, and the two of them materialize in a cell in Doomstock. The plan being to gas the two of them from a safe distance, which Namor isn't too fond of. And he's things that seems cowardly. But, uh... Maestro comes up with a plan, reverts to Banner, and then gets back into Hulk. Turns back into Maestro and frees uh, Abomination. It should be noted that the, uh, the cell they were, the floor, is adam the floor of the bars were adamantium. But it still has to be bolted to something. And they make a bit of a mess. Namor catches up to them. Blonsky plan intends to uh, has a plan. They have to grab. Uh, they have to get into uh, Doom's computer center, or at least Blonsky does. So when Namor catches up to uh, Abomination and Maestro, Hulk rips a hole in the floor for Abomination to go through. Abomination tears through. Uh, The various uh, Doom bots. Maestro and Namor continue to fight. With Namor stating that uh, it should have been the two of them. They should have brought the world to, to, to his knees. Nam they teamed up. Namor teamed up with Doom. And they both betrayed him. They could have. They could have ruled together. And Namor. Maestro explains that. Uh, he was betrayed because, because he was never trustworthy. 
No one believed in him. Not his friends, their allies, or loyal subjects. At best, they feared him. At worst, they wanted him gone. As Namor, Namor refuses to believe this, but it, a vision of his wife appeared, appears to him and says it's, it's true. The people of Atlantis lived in fear of uh, Namor, Namor's temper, his strength, his hatred for humanity. Then Dorma shows up, explaining that uh, he was Namor was never happy, not with her, not with Atlantis. Then Sue Storm, so you know he could never, that Namor could never accept that uh, she loved that Sue loved Reed. When he claims to have loved Sue, uh, Sue states that the vision of Sue states that the only one Namor ever loved was himself. And then Hulk punch, knocks him out with a single punch. My, Doom basically invites uh, my to Sanctum, where he's armored up. Uses the uh, cannon on the armor at, the, at his lowest setting to knock uh, Abomination down. When Human Torch lets off a blast of flame. Apparently, Abomination has sent Banner back to Dystopia, and uh, he's in Banner's he's in Doom's computer center. Apparently, the, while his computer raise was impressive, the security uh, is is absolute garbage. It never occurred to Doom that uh, someone other than him would you would use it. But apparently, uh, Blonsky has hacked the Human Torch and is in command of Torch's systems. And uh, basically, sets off uh, a Nova Blast. So, there are safety protocols that the Torch himself can survive, but he's overridden them. This will be the most in intense heat ever generated. And Namor walks in as the Human Torch goes Nova, and, and Doomstar is destroyed. Banner narrates, saying that even though he, he's thousands of miles away, he swears he can hear the, the detonation. Then the sky illuminates. People of Dystopia have no, no idea what caused it. Yes, it will take time for the people of Dystopia to recover from the damage that Namor's creature did, and they will look to, to Maestro to calm them, to protect them. Adding, villains always talk about conquering the world but they never seem to think about what they do once they've conquered it. The answer is, of course, they must now protect the people whom they were willing to step on to achieve that power. Otherwise, what's the point? The people are, of course, willing to go along because they had a taste of what the world can do to them if he's not there to serve as their defender. So his throne is rebuilt, and they grovel in front of him. He says that uh, it's funny. He was one of the founding first Avengers, then he was part of the Defenders, Namor and Torch were a part of a group, but in the end, groups aren't necessary, he supposes. If you're sufficiently strong and ingen genius enough, you don't need anybody. Not when you're the maestro. We have an, an epilogue on the edge of dystopia in Rick Jones' secret bunker. He's got uh, Dr. Doom's time platform. And uh, he's got a plan, the perfect plan, to stop the maestro. That plan is continued in Hulk, Future Imperfect, from about 30 years ago. That is where the series ends. I, I actually kind of like to see the, uh, the Mice Perfect maybe reprinted all together all, with Future Imperfect at the, at the tail end. I, that's one of those times where I'd probably willingly buy a tray, a collection that had that was comprised entirely of almost entirely of books I already own. But uh, anyway, that's going to do it for now. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, Live long and rock hard.